Good evening, my name is Graham Goulden, a former police officer from Scotland. I've previously spoken on this platform about how, I'm talking about how we respond to violence. In this particular piece, I'm going to talk about um, links between violence and masculinity. It's a subject that I feel very, very passionate about. Um, it's something that I feel that we don't talk about enough in society. We feel, we feel quite comfortable talking about knives and gangs, but we don't feel comfortable talking about the main gender of our perpetrator group and our victim group, which um, continues to be men. Um, I'll explain as we go along my feelings and thoughts on this, and um, towards the end talk about some of my responses and how I want to work better to engage men on this, this topic. You know, I want to start by a big shout out to the many men out there that I know, the good guys out there, my friends, my, my family members, my colleagues, who, like me, share a, a good range of healthy values. Um, we are good dads, we are good brothers, we are good sons, we are good husbands, we are good partners. Um, we do our best out there um, to be the best people that we can be. And at times that can be challenging for every single one of us. And I know myself over the last few years have really had to confront some of the challenges um, that men face, um, both in my professional capacity, but in my personal capacity as well. Um, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, as we as we go through, you know, two thousand and eight, and eight, my dad killed himself. My dad became a suicide statistic, um, and it really, I found that a very challenging time as a as a as a as a son, as a father, and I found myself um, trying to deal with other people's emotions and not my own emotions. Um, I just try to, you know, help other people. I didn't think about myself. I internalized a lot of thoughts. I started to think, did I did I make a mistake? Did I was I responsible for what happened to my dad? I really started to, um, yeah, think quite badly on, the, on these issues. And it wasn't until a friend reached out to me um, and really made me think a lot differently about, about this subject. And it really allowed me to start to apply a lens of gender to, um, a lens of gender to, 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 the, to the issue of, of, of suicide. You know, why is it when it comes to, to suicide in this country? That um, men make up, you know, make up most of the, the statistics. You know, around the world, um, suicide claims more lives than homicide and war put together. And around the world, men take point on these issues. Um, and we need to really start to be brave enough to start asking questions. For example, not only with relation to suicide, but violence as a whole. What's happening? You know, women are violent. We know that, and maybe that's another conversation. But, you know, I want to, I want questions. I want to answer some questions. Why is it when it comes to suicide that men are most at risk? Why is it when it, come, when it comes to violence, men are most at risk of becoming either victims or perpetrator, perpetrators? And we need to be really asking these questions. You know, across the world, our boys are struggling just now, academically, in relationships and sexually. And um, we need to find better ways to work with our boys on a range of issues. You know, the psychologist Philip Zimbardo in his TED talk, The Demise of Guys, really presents a, a quite disturbing picture of how our boys are doing around the world. Thankfully, he, he responds and gives some ways that we can deal with these issues in a, in a, a further talk, which I'll, I'll post some links after this talk on the, on the site. But um, we need to start asking the question, why? Are these you know why are we seeing these issues in our in our society um and and not simply fight back and i'll talk about that as we as we go through you know i really enjoy working with boys and men on talking about these issues and i often feel that these are subjects that our boys want to talk about we often say that our boys don't want to talk about this stuff men don't want to talk about this stuff but when you create the right conversation and the right situation i've had some very very powerful conversations with men on these issues you know when i work in prisons um i like to, to ask questions what type of men do you want to be what type of dads do you want to be what type of dads are you and more often than not i get um some wonderful responses from men about about how they feel as men they want to be confident competent they want to be good fathers they want to be good partners good husbands they want to to be respected for the right reasons um they want to be consistent these are good healthy values um, that they possess, but when you ask them about what are the challenges, that's when you start. We start to, to bring in the, stereo, the male stereotypes, 
that un, unemotional man, that aggressive man, that strong man, that you know is always right type of man. Um, and violence is often the tool that many men will use as a way to communicate their masculinity. And um, we're seeing that in our violence statistics, not only in this, this country, but around the world. Um, and I think a lot of the challenges on these issues come from society, societal society produce the stereotypes but i think the challenges for men come from other men and in many ways uh, i feel i see men um, policing other men as well as being policed by other men and um so i think men need to, to really step up around these issues i'll talk about that towards the end you know there's a there's a really good um video by the u.s wrestler mark miro again i'll put a link after this and in the video, he's talking about his mum. He's talking to a group of young men and young women, probably 14, 15, 16 years old. Um, and it's a really emotional story. As a, as a wrestler, professional wrestler, he committed himself to his career. And, and when his mum died, um, he started to have lots of reg uh, regrets in his life and how he'd committed himself more to his career than his, his mother. And um, in the film, the, the girls are really starting to bring out their emotions. The tears are flowing. But when you look at the boys, the boys are struggling. The boys are struggling to look at each other. Um, you can tell they want to cry, but they're not crying. They're being policed. And they're also policing the other boys in the room. And it's a real powerful moment to watch. And many people watch that and focus on Mark Miro's story. But I focus on the box, the box that these boys are in, because if they start to show emotion, they could be judged, they could be seen as something less than a man. And these stereotypes, they are destroying some boys. You know, the worst thing that a boy can be called by another boy is often a girl. Um, what does that say about our girls? What does that say about my daughters, if that's the worst thing that a boy can be called? And I also think that, as well as being very um, disturbing for young men, I think these stereotypes are at the root a lot of the issues that we are seeing in society. You know, around teen pregnancies, the, the pressure to for men, for boys and men to be sexually active. You know, we often talk about how many girls were impregnated. You know, get, so how many girls were, were were pregnant last year? We we often fail to talk about how many boys or how many men impregnated females. You know, and I think the stereotypes are driving a lot of the issues that we're seeing in our in, in our society. When you talk about sexual violence, domestic violence, violence in general, as I said before, men take point. On these issues men make up the most victim group the most perpetrator group and it's something we need to start to talk about yeah said before women are violent can't ignore that fact but the facts tell us that when it comes to violence men make up the main groups perpetrators and victims and we need to start asking why is that why why is that the case what is contributing to these to these um statistics around around men you know making up these 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 types of statistics and why is violence a tool for far too many men um who are expressing their masculinity you know i've known many women out there who have been victims of some men's violence i've known i have a friend who lost his life to knife violence um and in many ways I've been indirectly affected by men's violence. And in the last piece of the camera that I spoke before, I talked about we all need to stop waiting for violence to become personal because it has the potential to be deeply personal to everybody watching this, this piece tonight. Um, don't wait for it to happen. So for me, what's needed, well, what's needed is the courage from men to step up, to step away from the being defensive and the what about three what about women who are who are violent we know women are violent we know men are victims of some women's violence we know that but we need men to move beyond that and start to accept some of the facts that i've talked about we need better leadership from men that's why i think we need to be looking at men need to step up and that's going to take courage from time to time um, but we need men to be better leaders out there um, and I think this leadership will be very beneficial. We're going to get something back. This isn't just about us giving. We're going to get something back from our leadership. And that is a better world for our boys and a better world for us as, as, as men. Um, and I think that's something we, we can get back. And surely that's a good thing, I, I would say. You know, we'd stop challenging um, people who talk about men's violence and stop simply fighting back. Um, and I think this 
you know, the, the conversation of, often turns into a sort of form of trench warfare between men on this side and some women on this side. And yeah, there's me and there's other men and women in the middle trying to engage our boys and men. And um, we need to stop this mudslinging from, from, from both sides. That might be controversial, but I see it. And um, I just want a, a nice safe space to have conversations with men. Because you know what? I think boys and men actually want these and demand these conversations and when you have them you get something quite quite productive um in in return you know so for me we need a better narrative around these issues these issues a narrative that doesn't simply indict men it invites men into a conversation you know the u.s um organization a call to men um led by the wonderful tony porter and tony once said to me you know in many ways we need to meet men where they are at we need to meet men where they are at on these issues we can't simply expect men to come along with us we've got to meet them and accept some failings accept some of their viewpoints and just find ways of bringing men along with us we just can't simply say you must follow this line of thinking or whatever find a place where men can feel safe and meet them where they're at that's that's something which i feel very passionate about and it's something i've from that moment i met tony porter um, in a restaurant in Worcester, I remember it like it was yesterday, and he just said to me, we need to meet men where they're at. It's something I've really tried to take on since since that day. You know, you know, for so my approach in working with men is twofold. As I've started to hint at the, throughout the, this conversation, I, w I like to start from a position of being positive about men. I firmly believe that the vast majority of men in this world are good guys um, with some good, healthy values but they face many challenges which often stop them from being the men they actually want to be. So I feel if you always start with a negative, that's when the pushback can happen. Um, and I like to start with a positive conversation about values, about their brand, about the type of men they are, the type of dads they want to be, the type of dads they are. Um, in many ways, when you start with that notion of respect, you're going to get respect back and you'll get a lot more back. And a lot more for me is the a powerful conversation that you can have with young men and young and young men and, and men around around these issues. I also think step two for me, so as well as starting with the positive, step one, step two is I look at men not as the problem but as the solution. So I tend to identify men as the friend, the classmate, the teammate, the work colleague, the family member. I look at them as the bystander and you know the bystander approach that I use in my work is not simply to teach people to intervene, it's to it's a way of engaging people into a, into the conversation. Um, and I find that when you move away from looking at men as the problem or the potential problem, it's a great way to, as I say, invite men into the conversation rather than indict them um, around these issues. And my experience when, when men are, when men feel challenged, when they feel seen as the problem, they will, they will fight back. That's when the, that's when the defensiveness will, will, will kick in. Um, and I often think that we need to, to look at how we apply academia around these issues. Um, academia is important. It's answered so many questions. It's indeed created more questions, which is good. Um, but um, we need to start to look at the language we use in some of our sessions with men. You know, I've seen men run a thousand miles when you use words like gender and patriarchy. Um, we take some of the academic language out of these conversations and just have the conversation with men. You know, as I said before, in my view, men enjoy these conversations and they want these conversations. And any opportunity to talk to men about these issues, I feel, is a good thing. Um, as well as a better narrative on engaging men, I feel we need to think about a better narrative in the way that we help our young boys um, out there. Our boys are living in a world where men who work in early years childcare, who work with young children, us. Uh, people are suspicious of these men. Um, that is communicating not a good message about men in this in this world. And boys and men are li are also living. So young boys are living in a world where some men are committing a lot of violence against men, women, and children. And I, I feel we need a better narrative to really reassure them. And that narrative has to come from other men. We need we need men to be the guideposts that our boys need and deserve. Um, at this time, you know, in the TED Talks and Zambaro talks about how boys are going into 
the virtual world because the real world is really confusing and really scary. And the virtual world is where they're in control. And we know what happens in the virtual world. Our boys are exposed to harmful media, pornography, computer games, music imagery, and the stereotypes of being men are even more rigid. Um, and we need to make the real world more, more comfortable and more welcoming for our young, our young men. Just now, it's a scary place to be. Um, so I think we need a better narrative for boys simply for to just to make them feel a bit safer in this real world. So just to bring this to a conclusion, men are key here. Um, women are also key, but I feel men taking a stand against a lot of the issues that I've discussed are so, so important. We need men, as I say, to be the right sort of guideposts that our boys need in our lives. We need men not to simply just talk about their feelings, but to create the opportunities where other men can talk about their feelings. Um, and then I think when we start to see this form of role modeling out there, we'll see major advances in our work. Um, men hold many of the answers to many of men's problems. Um, and when it comes to all forms of violence, including suicide, I just want men to be better leaders. I just want men to embrace these issues and confront these issues together. Thanks.